Hi, I'm Robert Foss. I uh, work for Collabra and uh, I do open source stuff for a living, typically uh, Linux graphics, uh, user space, and kernel stuff. Um, and this talk is about Android and how you can run like uh, the Android open source project on top of essentially whatever hardware you want, at least as long as it has an, um, a decent graphics driver. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, so Android history, Android on mainline, and what the current status is and what we're going, where we're going from there is what we're going to talk about. And the Android history is interesting, and I'm going to visualize it for you. This is the number of lines uh, of diff against uh, the mainline kernel that, uh, the, and that Qualcomm and their kernel is. So it's between, let's see, 1.5 and like 3.5 million lines of diff. And this is for their uh, common kernel uh, for specific uh, chipsets. It's even larger. And then for every specific chipset, they also ship a, uh, a kernel branch for every single uh, cell phone that is shipping, at least the major ones. So as you can imagine, this is uh, uh, actually even larger in, uh, yeah, for most devices. Uh, so uh, this is how we got here. Android forked the kernel, uh, and that's fine. That's what open source is for. They had good reasons to do so, uh, because the graphics stack and infrastructure wasn't particularly good. It didn't suit their needs particularly well. Uh, essentially, support for low-power devices was very much lacking, uh, and uh, the overall like graphics subsystem really needed an, an overhaul. Um, so, specifically, uh, a feature that was much requested is uh, atomic support. And atomic, in this context, means that you can do a bunch of changes at the same time. Like, uh, maybe you want to change the resolution of your output, and maybe the update frequency, and maybe the, the color format all at once, uh, just so that it all happens at once. But also, if one of the operations fail, let's say uh, the resolution change goes through, but the color format change bounces for whatever reason, uh, you don't want to be or end up in a state that's unknown because that's how you get bugs, uh, and it's no fun. So in order to avoid this, um, from oh, within Google, uh, the ADF, the Android Atomic Display Framework, was created, and it is just that. Uh, it is atomic and solves or scratches their particular itch, but it's not extensible or generic and it doesn't support uh, atomic uh, operations for anything but planes. So in a graphics stack, there, or in the, uh, there are a bunch of graphics components, like uh, the um, display controller, the CRTC. There are planes and a few other parts. Uh, planes happen to be essentially like a buffer for a part of something that's going to render on the screen. But I'm going to visualize that later. Uh, so let's pause that for a second. Um, additionally, the ADF wasn't compatible with the current or then current uh, uh, ABI that was used in the kernel. So it was a hard sell to uh, it basically throw out everything that was old and replace it with something new that didn't really suit everyone's needs apart from Google's. Um, so uh, it wasn't really upstreamable. And this is where we were for a bit until the uh, Atomic KMS ABI was introduced by Daniel Vetter. And this solves uh, our problems. Uh, it supports all of the ADF use cases. It uses a thing called properties. Properties are essentially just strings with uh, values attached to them. And you can attach them to any like object in the uh, graphics pipeline, essentially. Uh, so you can be very gem generic and support wonderfully weird hardware. Um, without rewriting the kernel every single time. And uh, it is now being, uh, uh, and it's now replacing ADF for most vendors. Uh, yeah, I think all vendors are on board, and they're at the very least slowly rolling it out now. Um, so um, let's have a look at what uh, this looks like in practice. Um, 
if you want, you totally can run uh, the Android Open Source project on just any kernel, essentially. Uh, but it does require some uh, um, extra bits, and we're going to get into that. Uh, so this is what the uh, Android graphics stack essentially looks like, if I grossly simplify it, uh, and I will. So um, there are uh, a few basic layers, and they're stacked essentially like this. So there are the apps. This is what it's all about. This is what we want. Um, like, actually, the apps are the point. So uh, they're an important part. Then there's Surface Flinger, which sort of mediates between uh, the different apps. And in Android, um, everything is sort of an app. Even the stuff you don't think of as an app is an app. Uh, like the notification toolbar, that's, that's an app. And all of these have to be integrated in some way so that uh, you can have a pleasant user interaction. Uh, and that's essentially what Surface Flinger does. Um, it also speaks or talks to the hardware. So it does this app organization, and then it communicates that to the hardware. And it does that uh, through the HWC2 uh, protocol. So this is essentially uh, what it organizes. Uh, this is just. Um, some desktop, and it contains an app for the status bar, it contains an app for the navigational bar, and if you have a look over here, see they overlap, and it's not a problem. That's, that's Surface Flinger doing good stuff. Um, you can also see that uh, uh, these parts um, are mostly transparent, and uh, these parts are also what uh, I previously referred to as planes. So there's a plane for the status bar, and there's a plane for the navigational bar, and they're all overlaid on top of the background. Um, so so uh, the status bar, for example, is backed by a, a very, a relatively small buffer with, uh, yeah, I guess, it, it's pretty wide, but not terribly tall. And the opposite is true for the navigational bar, and it's all just stacked on top of the background. Um, and this process of stacking these things is called uh, compositing and, or composing. And um, uh, this is something that we have actual hardware to do because it's kind of slow and it's power intensive. And you can make it really fast in, in hardware if you want to and if you have support for it. Um, and this whole stack of stuff is communicated through the HWC2 uh, layer to, uh, to the driver and then it deals with it somehow. Uh, so, uh, the HWC2 implementation is implemented by uh, the vendor driver, uh, which will be whatever Qualcomm gives you or whatever, uh, I guess, NVIDIA gives you. It'll implement HWC2. And uh, uh, the, hardware, the hardware composer uh, does do some interesting stuff, and it's surprisingly complicated. Um, so it just gets layers through the HWC API, which sounds simple enough. Uh, these layers have stuff attached to them, data, metadata like uh, x and y coordinates, uh, widths, heights, uh, maybe color information, and um, the order in the stack, for example. And if we take these properties into account, maybe we'll be able to do less work. Uh, so then these layers are optimized for display. And optimizing for display sounds, I don't know, kind of hand wavy. You uh, do stuff to it, and it becomes better. But it's pretty practical, because the hardware for these things are, are very much limited. Uh, maybe your display hardware only supports four layers. And as you saw in my picture before, we had three layers without really doing anything. Actually, there are a few I didn't even talk about, like the desktop icons and stuff like that. So there's lots of stuff going on. And we very easily reach four layers. And that's what very fancy hardware supports. Some hardware, much of hardware, supports only one layer or, or maybe two layers. So if we have more than that, we can't just send um, like a, more, more layers to the hardware than it supports. It won't work. So we have to sort of smash some layers together before sending them out to the hardware. And intelligently choosing which layers to combine is, uh, yeah, that's where, where you get a lot of power savings if you do it cleverly. But if you only combine maybe the, the smallest layers, 
uh, the, the hardware ends up uh, doing, or the, sorry, if you end up combining the largest layer on the software side, uh, the hardware doesn't have to do all that much work and there are very minimal power savings, for example. Um, additionally, it's kind of tantalizing to think why, why, why not just build hardware that supports infinite numbers of layers, but uh, unfortunately, it's kind of expensive to implement in hardware. Um, storing all this data and, and making sure that you had, have hardware or IP blocks that can uh, efficiently combine them uh, quickly is something that requires a lot of space in terms of uh, silicon. And yeah, we all want cheap ships, so uh, they don't support more than four layers typically. And uh, then uh, these combined or squashed layers are then just sent to the hardware, which does whatever it does. It uh, takes the, the buffers, combines them into a single buffer, and then sends them out over whatever connector you have to your display, and then your display displays it, hopefully. So that's basically the stack uh, for uh, hardware compositing. So uh, this uh, is the user space part of the driver. Uh, having everything living in, living in the kernel would be terrible for various reasons, security being one. Um, so uh, and much of the driver, most of the driver lives in, in user space. Of course, a, um, a part does live in the kernel too, but uh, typically it's a lot smaller and deals with talking to the hardware, like uh, talking to registers, making sure that the hardware is ready to accept jobs, that kind of stuff. Um, so this is also the part that implements the APIs uh, you're familiar with, like OpenCL, Vulkan, OpenGL, yeah, whatever it may be. Um, and of course, the hardware composer um, for Android anyway. And yeah, in the bottom we have the kernel. You kind of need a kernel, so there it is. So the thing, uh, or the thing about where we are now is that mainline, uh, the mainline Linux kernel has a very good graphics API, and it's so good that uh, some Google devices have shipped using it. Um, so the Pixel C, I think, was the first device that shipped using the, um, the Android KMS uh, or Atomic KMS API. Um, but if you want to ship it, you kind of need something to implement the HWC. And since you're not using NVIDIA's fancy driver or uh, whatever it may be, uh, you need some software, com software component to implement HWC. And uh, Mesa, which is where it so, or where graphic stuff typically is implemented in the graphic stack does not implement it, nor does the kernel, certainly not the kernel anyway. Uh, so someone, something else needs to do it, and that project is called DRM Hardware Composer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it has a very long, very dull name, but uh, it sort of says what it does on the tin. And uh, this is uh, where it lives in the stack. So this blob is typically proprietary, and if we break it out into the open source components, uh, this is what we end up seeing. So uh, there's the kernel, and there's the driver, uh, which is actually a bunch of components. What you think of as the driver is a bunch of stuff. And on top of it, we have the RM hardware composer. Um, this bunch of stuff is Mesa, libdrm, and, and some other things. <laughs> it, it's actually quite a few components. Uh, there's also Graloc, which is the graphics memory allocator. Uh, there's no such, there's no software project called Graloc. There's a bunch of implementations, and it's a giant mess. And memory allocation in this space is unsolved, <laughs> essentially. So uh, it's still a, a giant mess, especially when you want to have like memory that different hardware components can actually all use together. It, gets pretty problematic when, for example, your GPU supports only some uh, color formats, and then your display uh, hardware only supports some other color for formats. Um, you can't really output whatever your GPU is, uh, is presenting in that case. So uh, that's why the Graloc situation is, is tricky. Um, but there are a few uh, Graloc implementations that sort, it, that sort this out for at least the, the display hardware. So it's fine. It's manageable. Um, 
So uh, about DRM Hardware Composer, uh, it's a Google project that uh, was written by a guy called Sean Paul. And uh, it came from the Chromium OS project, um, where yeah, Chromium OS and Android are sort of related. They do use some of the same t technology stack. And now, uh, now Android runs inside of Chrome OS, which is slightly perverse. Um, in like a VM, so there's Android inside of Chrome OS, and uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, the project was found within Chrome, uh, the Chromium OS project, um, and since then it's been liberated and now lives where essentially all uh, uh, open source graphics projects live, live uh, at uh, freedesktop.org. This is where you'll find uh, Mesa, the the, uh, the OpenGL driver, for example, and most of the other projects. Um, so, I'd like to thank Google for liberating DRM Hardware Composer. It's been very helpful for the community at large and for us who want to run Android on not phones. Uh, so, uh, Jean Paul, Pune Kumar, and Marissa Wall have all been super helpful. So, thanks, guys. Um, and if you want to contribute, you can do so. It's hosted on gitlab.freedesktop.org. You can just submit a pull request, and people will complain about it, surely. But uh, yeah, it's all there. Um, so this leads us to the bigger picture. Um, why should users and product manufacturers even care about this stuff? Why does it matter uh, how this stuff is implemented? And it sort of does, uh, because uh, we want to be able to, to develop new features or support new features that are in hardware, and we want them supported in our software stack. And doing so is kind of tricky, um, because if you want to uh, introduce a new feature, or sorry, if you want to introduce a new feature uh, into the kernel, you sort of need to use it somewhere in order to say this stuff works. Like, I've tested it at least once. Uh, so you want a project that you quickly can implement support for in the user space. That's where DRM hardware composer can come in, if you want. Uh, another part of it is how features seem to migrate. So if we looked at the ADF, the uh, display framework that was introduced by Android, um, it had a lot of good ideas, like Atomic. And uh, these things like seem to move from the Android kernel into the, uh, the mainline kernel. So very slowly, at like a glacial pace, uh, all of us are taking advantage of this stuff, even though it's sort of in an indirect way. Uh, we're not using the exact same code, but uh, the idea is the same. Um, but this doesn't really apply to everything. Uh, if we look, at, look into the, uh, the uh, diff, or the, the number of lines that are different between main, the mainline kernel and the Qualcomm kernel, for example, we see that, yeah, some subsystems seem to have very large diffs. So, uh, yeah, 13% 13, 13 as uh, drivers and uh, the GPU stuff, um, which is a decent, decent size. Uh, but much of this stuff, uh, like drivers for other things, are never going to be upstreamed because uh, no one cares strongly enough about it, essentially. Some things uh, are just not really reasonable to upstream anyway. Like, for example, uh, um, a fingerprint reader for, uh, uh, for your phone. It's mostly like a shell around, around a, a, a signed uh, encrypted blob of firmware. So, I mean, you can write that driver that uploads this, this blob to, to the hardware, but it's not very useful to anyone. Like, no one will enjoy that. So uh, upstreaming it wouldn't be, acceptable, wouldn't be acceptable to the wider community, and you as an end user wouldn't see any changes, or it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to interact with it any differently anyway. Um, another conclusion we can draw is that uh, the difference in number of lines uh, between the mainline kernel and the Qualcomm kernel seems it's like pretty constant like there's it's not going down drastically the ideal <laughs> the ideal scenario would be for it to shrink towards zero but it's somewhat constant i had a quick look today at uh, some of the la the latest kernels and it's 1.8 uh, 
1.8 or 1.9 million lines of diff. So yeah, it hasn't really shrunk. Uh, so yeah, that's it's kind of interesting. Um, but what we also want to do is push the industry towards open source. And we want it not just because it gives us warm and fuzzy feelings, or it gives me warm and fuzzy feelings anyway, uh, but it, it's actually very helpful in terms of deploying products. If uh, the entire stack is accessible to everyone and is in a working state immediately, you can bang out a product pretty quickly. You don't have to spend months trying to configure software and make it work when it should work to begin with. Um, increasing the speed also increase, uh, or means uh, lowering like, development costs. So as a product manufacturer, this, this stuff really matters to you. Um, and something that we've been seeing is that the open source drivers have a quality that is much, much higher than the proprietary ones. Um, much of the code is shared between different drivers, and it, that means a lot of edge cases are found. Also, there's a lot of testing for the, all, the different types of hardware. Uh, so they all sort of uh, benefit from it. Uh, and uh, yeah, we also want to just push open source adoption into the industry. Like it's, especially with vendors, it's hard. They don't really care about software. They're, they're not into that. They are into selling chips, and that's what they care about. But if there is a viable open source story, they're definitely more interested. Uh, yeah. And that's about it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? So you mentioned that the diff doesn't seem to be shrinking, but um, is it the case that maybe stuff is migrating, but they're still pouring more stuff into the, the fork kernels? Yeah, so stuff is definitely migrating, uh, but there's more stuff coming in, like new stuff, weirder hardware, more hardware. So stuff is definitely moving, and I would hope in the long, long term that the diff ac actually shrinks, but it's hard to say. But it's really mostly about drivers, right? Like not core kernel logic, hopefully. It's mostly drivers, yes. So to try um, DRM hardware composer, yeah. what version of Surface Flinger Android do we need? What version of Mesa DRM kernel do we need? So there are some sample projects that you can essentially bring up on um, there, sorry, uh, there are development platforms like the HiKey 960, for example, uh, which you can bring up with like three command line lines. Like it's very simple. You'll pull down the Android uh, AOSP project and the required kernels and the blobs for that platform, and they'll all be combined and built for you. And it's surprisingly not tricky. Uh, so you can get up and start it, and then start modifying stuff however you like. Uh, pretty quickly. Like, it'll take you four hours to build, <laughs> but that's fine. So on what kind of hardware could this be tried out today? So, sorry? So on what kind of hardware could you try this out today? Uh, you, like you, an ARM tablet or x86 laptop? Or? Yeah, yes, either. All of the above. Uh, essentially, everything that has an open source uh, graphics driver or, or display driver is a viable target. And um, I think all of the drivers are in good enough shape to try it. I think uh, you could even try it on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, that would, however, be a little bit tricky. I don't have like a three-line solution for that, but uh, you can if you want to. Okay, thank you. Then, round of applause. <laughs>